Hello there, so it's finally time I get into reviewing a Star Wars game, as you might have noticed in my other videos, I'm a bit of a fan. On that note, the last time I tried to use the slightest bit of Star Wars music in my Nexus review, I had to bring out these guys to avoid a copyright claim. And this game kind of has a lot of that kind of music, so what I'm going to do this time around to get you guys in the mood, is play the maximum amount of Star Wars music I'm allowed to at the start so we can get that out the way. Okay, are you ready? Here we go. Star Wars The Force Unleashed is a third person hack and slash game where you play as an overpowered protagonist at the levels of an isekai anime character, but in a Star Wars game. Like look at the reveal trailer for this game. First time seeing this trailer I was like what? This got a lot of people interested in the game because this was outright bending or breaking a lot of what had been established as what characters in Star Wars could do with the force. I mean the best Luke Skywalker could do while training was barely lifting an X-Wing and in this trailer this dude almost casually brings down a freaking Star Destroyer. And not only that, this guy is Darth Vader's secret apprentice too. At the time this is pretty mind blowing stuff to me because what about that rule of two thing the Sith had going? Which the writers are like he's a secret apprentice. Don't worry we thought about it. Okay but before I dive too deep into the story let's chat a bit about how the game came into existence. Long ago in the mid 2000s thousands, LucasArts wanted to explore the idea of a story between the period of Revenge of the Sith and A New Hope, which unlike now is a very vague period in the Star Wars lore. So they threw a few concepts for a game around, one of which featured players playing as a super powerful Wookiee rebel. Though George didn't like that one because the main character couldn't talk. They messed around with a few more concepts involving gadgets and tricked out vehicles, but those didn't feel right. Eventually they got to the idea of what if we went crazy with the force powers by unleashing them completely. So like most anime isekai writers, they went hard on the full power fantasy. LucasArts then made some cool concept art and put together some rough mock-up videos of what the game would be like. Seeing the idea for the game coming together and how cool it looked, they were sold to make it. Now they just had to convince George, who got pitched this new idea and was like, yeah, let's go for it. Also, he added that the story for the game needed to hit every Star Wars story beat, so Jedi mentor, love interest, comic sidekick, etc. With that mandate, LucasArts went hard to work on the game. They wanted to go all out with this game, as in their view this is the next chapter in the Star Wars saga. So they even called in ILM to help with some of their face and motion capture tech, which wasn't very common in video games at the time. In addition to that, LucasArts wanted to put all the advanced tech they could into this game, including Havoc Physics and Euphoria Engine, which was described as, and I'm not joking, true biomechanical AI. It's basically the tech that allows NPCs to grab stuff and avoid attacks in game. It's actually pretty cool. The last bit of tech they included was Digital Molecular Matter or DMM. This replicates the substance of objects which makes things in game react more realistically when you interact with them. So think metal bending, wood splitting and plants wobbling? Getting all of this to work together in one game was a pain but eventually they got it all working together, mostly. With all that super advanced tech in the game, they now had to work on the gameplay. Which they developed a deeply focused core mantra for when making the game, which was... What is the core gameplay? <laughs> Okay, so not that deep, but I like their spirit. And to be fair, they pretty much achieved their aim, though the combat focuses more on the limited force power side of things than maybe skillfulness. Which, if you're building a power fantasy game, isn't a bad idea. Like, the closest thing to real life is all us pretending to open automatic sliding doors with the force. Don't act like you haven't, we've all done it. But in this game, you can bend doors open or throw stormtroopers around for fun. It's pretty much a pure force fantasy power trip. Though, before I get into that, how does it run? Okay, so this game was made for Xbox 360 and PS3 consoles and initially wasn't going to be ported to PC. Which, when LucasArts tried to explain why by saying well you can't scale the physics to work on most PCs, only really high end ones, it seemed like a reasonable explanation on the surface. But some people did notice the game was also getting a release on Wii, PS2, PSP and Nintendo DS. So not pointing it to PC seemed more like they didn't think of it sold than technical reasons. And to be fair those other console ports were basically entire different versions of the game made for each platform. Though after some outcry from PC gamers, LucasArts with some help from Aspire Mia did eventually port the game to PC, with all the DLCs including the Ultimate Sith edition of the game. But this was a very basic port as you can tell by the in-game menus and options which are taken directly from the console version of the game. Like the save system was taken from consoles and only works with checkpoints so you can't save wherever you want. I wasn't a fan of that. However there is a basic startup option menu though it's only going to help with selecting resolutions up to 1080p which if you want to go higher you're going to have to mess around with a config file. Also while you can play this game with mouse and keyboard I suggest playing with a controller. It might be less awkward. Another thing you may notice is there's no option for higher frame rates beyond 30fps and while you can use a player made patch to get higher frame rates, which 
which does look pretty good. It'll break some of the force powers and cause the game to crash more than it already does, which is already a fair bit. If you want to try it, I'll put a link in the description on how to do it. But for me, I stuck with a more um, cinematic frame rate, so I didn't have to deal with the game crashing so much. So as a port, it's very bare bones and didn't impress me very much, but at least it runs mostly, I guess. At least the visuals are pretty good for the time they were released in. It's a little rough around the edges sometimes, with especially the character's teeth looking like they belong in a shark or something. But it was pushing a lot of what could be done at the time with face capture and does give the characters a lot more subtle emotions in their performances. Which makes the cutscenes fairly high quality, though those are all pre-rendered so they could probably get a more cinematic feel for the game. And if they went with in-game ones, the slight tendency for jank in the game might come through more. Levels pretty much nail the Star Wars experience, from space station hallways to junk planets and alien jungles. All feel like they came directly from Star Wars movies. It's all great. The music adds to this as they use a lot of tracks directly from the movies, which I mean if you had access to John Williams' catalogue, wouldn't you? I mean, I wish I could. Though the game does have some original tracks just made for the game, which do fit in nicely. Some complaints I would have about the music is sometimes a bit random and doesn't really match what's happening on screen. And in certain levels it just cuts off. <laughs> but at least the sound effects are all on point, like blasters, lightsabers, tie fighters and even gonk droids just saying gonk. It's all great at setting up the Star Wars vibes. The storytelling does this too. It probably sticks a little too hard to the Star Wars formula at times, but it does a good job of nailing some of the Star Wars story beats that George wanted in the game. It also does some interesting things with the lore, that due to the purchase of the IP by Disney is now all in the Purge Legends category of Star Wars lore, which is kind of the what if section of Star Wars now. Though if fans make enough noise about anything in Legends, Disney will throw something together like a reference or even reintroduce things in a way that makes sense with the official lore. Some things survived this purging of the lore, like the Apprentice thing. In 2008, Anakin slash Darth Vader got two apprentices. One was when he was a Jedi in the Clone Wars named Ahsoka, and the other being Starkiller, the guy who plays in the Force Unleashed, who only comes along after Anakin becomes Darth Vader in the time before the New Hope movie. These apprentices even share some similarities, like how they hold lightsabers. Some sharing of notes must have been going on around at LucasArts that year. Ahsoka started out not being liked by fans, but survived the lore purge. And now she's quite popular and even got a cool live action debut. Starkiller, on the other hand, didn't survive the purge and was put in the Legends category. I can understand why this is done, because Starkiller in this game is way too overpowered, and not just with with literal force powers but also in the way his story plays out. Which I'll get into detail in the story section in a while, just trust me, he's way OP. This game was set up way too much as a power fantasy for it to fit reasonably into the Star Wars lore. Though some of the more recent movies make me question what is reasonable in Star Wars anymore. Like Starkiller's story could fit in if they changed some of the bigger story points and toned down his powers a little. Though regardless of the game being canon, or not, the way the game is set up is more for fun and the devs of LucasArts knew they were making a power fantasy game with crazy force powers. As you can tell just the sheer number of costumes they included in the game. Like if you you wanted to, you could roleplay as a clone trooper with a lightsaber. Talking about troopers, another reason I know this game probably couldn't fit into the lore is stormtroopers can actually aim in this game. That true biomechanical AI tech is working just a little too well. Anyway, another interesting thing you may notice about this game is it's a little similar to the God of War games. From camera angles to over the top action and quick time events, which maybe the game uses a little too much of, but isn't to the point of annoyance. The game even uses orbs similar to God of War. But there was one thing at least this game did before the more modern God of War games did it. Months of attacking Imperial targets and Vader sends a boy to fight me? Don't make me put you down, boy. I can't let you live, boy. Read it, boy. I wouldn't outright call it a clone of God of War, but maybe it's um too inspired by it. And because of this, it makes players approach the game with a melee combat mindset instead of how Lucas Arts one of them played, which was. <laughs> Okay, so this bit is going to be a bit tricky to explain, but I hope you get what I'm saying. In older God of War games, you didn't rely on range attacks too much, and it was more melee combat focused. Though to be fair, the melee attacks did give a fair bit of range. But with the Force Unleashed, in order to use your melee attacks, you really need to get close to use the lightsaber, which with all the range enemies and the game's not so perfect lock-on system, usually meant soaking up a fair bit of damage, which doesn't feel great. Lucas Arts wanted players to focus more on using the Force abilities than the melee ones, which is an interesting approach that would have made it stand out from other hack and slash games. The game, however, doesn't quite get this across initially as you'll have fun messing around with the force abilities for a bit, but I'll try and get some melee action going more often as your default attack. As to be fair, that's what most hack and slash games do, which is focus on getting melee combos going. I think LucasArts was aware of this as they did include enemies that are resistant to long range force attacks, which does make you have to vary it up at times and use melee attacks. And there are enemies that just use melee, but they aren't usually by themselves. So now the problem of being shot from a distance gets amplified because now you have to close in on certain enemies while others can shoot at you from a distance. You can tell what they were going for with gameplay, but it doesn't quite work. So most 
most are still going to see this game as a melee focused hack and slash game with some force powers, rather than what LucasArts wanted which is a game that mainly uses force powers with some melee. If you do play the game enough you'll eventually get the hint to use the force powers a bit more than melee, and to be fair the recharge rate of the powers is fairly generous. But it always feels a bit like you're going against the grain by doing this, or like you're cheesing the game by relying so much on the force powers. Though don't get me wrong, the force powers are great fun to use, but after a while using the force powers feels like using an easy win button. Which I mean does make sense because this game is a full on power fantasy, it wants you to go crazy and use these overcharged force powers. But there isn't maybe enough challenge or skill in using them in most of the game. Except maybe the boss battles which do sometimes need you to mix the force abilities with melee. There is another problem, the controls in combat feel a little awkward at times with how the game selects what you want to pick or use your force powers on. It's not terrible but it's enough to get you out of the flow of combat at times. If you're up against a few enemies it's not such a big deal, as you can spam force powers and not think too tactically about what you have to do. But when the numbers of enemies increase and there's one you want to focus on, it gets a little tricky to get the game to do what you want to do. Which I guess makes the game more challenging but not in a way that's in your control. All that being said, the game does at points make you feel like an unstoppable force of nature. Just getting a few combos together and basically <laughs> There is a fair selection of moves you can unlock that combine force powers with melee a bit, like I enjoyed stunning enemies with force lightning then following up with a melee combo, though the upgrades for force powers themselves will probably be more useful. The way you unlock these is by gaining experience and leveling up doing missions which gives you different spheres for power, combos and talent. It's your standard level up system where you can put points where you like and everything just gets a little bigger and better. To buff you up even more there are Sith holocrons around the map that give you a boost to damage or just plain unlimited power. Also there are these more standard Jedi holocrons around the map that give you extra XP or more spheres or unlock stuff like different crystals for your lightsaber. These crystals aren't just for different colors as they are ones that give different effects to your lightsaber and they're separate from the color ones. So you're not forced to use a specific color because it has an effect you want. This kind of customization I enjoy as it gives you the freedom to make the kind of lightsaber you like. What is also nice is this all carries over if you want to do another playthrough of the game. As the story does have a little replay value because of the two different endings but you don't need to play the whole game, just the last mission. The Sith edition of the game comes with all three DLCs, one of which is a fun what if scenario that has Starkiller turning Luke to the dark side. Another one being cut content from the initial games release where you go through some Jedi trials. And the last one is a bit ridiculous as you end up fighting Obi-Wan Kenobi's ghost. All the DLCs are really short, each being about 30 minutes or so, but are mostly separate from the rest of the game and don't add much to the story, which we should talk about. But if you don't want spoilers then skip to here. So in a classic Star Wars intro style we get a text scroll about the set of the galaxy which isn't looking so great. The Galactic Empire has pretty much wiped out most Jedi, but there are a few left that the Emperor wants Darth Vader to take care of personally. One of them is on Kashyyyk, the Wookiee's homeworld, which is going through a bit of revolt against the Empire, though Darth Vader isn't here to deal with that trouble. Now what's a little interesting is how the game starts with you playing as Darth Vader with mostly max powers, so it gives you an excuse to go crazy with the force powers at the start while being a bit of a fun tutorial. I mean who wouldn't have fun tossing around Wookiees like they're frisbees? Also what this does is it gives you a reference for how strong Vader is and how strong you could become over the length of the game. Now once Vader's mowed through enough wikis he finds the reason he came. Fairly average Jedi who after a bit of a fight does only slightly better than a youngling against Vader. But after defeating the Jedi and questioning him for information, a kid manages to force steal Vader's lightsaber right out of his hand. I can only imagine what Vader was thinking at this point. Impressive. Though before the kid can do anything, Vader snaps the Jedi's neck and comes to the conclusion that this must be the Jedi's child, and a pretty powerful kid too. Imperials rush in to try and be proactive to impress the boss, but they probably should have taken the day off, because Vader has plans for this kid to help him overthrow the Emperor. Time skip a few years later and the kid is now all grown up and a very obedient secret apprentice to Vader who you get the impression hasn't treated him well over the years of training, which he's nearing the end of. To finish the apprentice training, Vader sends him to kill some Jedi, the first of which launched an attack on the Empire with some rebellious forces but not the actual rebels, we'll get to that later. Vader tells his apprentice now known as Starkiller not to leave any witnesses when going after the Jedi, and that includes Imperials, because if the Emperor finds out it could be bad for both of them. On Starkiller's way out he bumps into an old frenemy, no not that one, there's a droid called Proxy who's programmed to help Starkiller in his training by trying to kill him when he least expects it. Yeah, Sith training methods are pretty extreme. Proxy ironically however is Starkiller's only friend, we're not trying to kill him of course, but is quickly joined by a new highly trained Imperial pilot named Juno Eclipse, who's instantly set up as a love interest. On a tangent, you can tell these cutscenes were made by people who really did see this game as the next chapter in the Star Wars saga and we're really passionate about making it. The cinematography and editing are all near movie quality which really gives the game a Star Wars feel. I mean they even went the extra mile to add little details. Like you see how Proxy is walking in this scene? He's copying Juno's walk at the start and then when Starkiller asserts himself in the chat he starts copying Starkiller's walk. They didn't need to add stuff like that but it's there and it's pretty great. Okay back to the story. Why does Starkiller need a new pilot? Well let's just say his missions don't always go smoothly. Then we're walking into a trap. How many pilots have you lost before me? Seven. Excellent. Starkiller's first target is General Coda, an old Jedi who survived the Clone Wars by not using clones, which helped him avoid that infamous Order 66. This mission has you mowing down everyone in the station. Remember, no witnesses. 
Once Star Killer reaches Coda, he's a bit disappointed he's facing off against the boy and not Vader, though he quickly learns how powerful Star Killer is. Eventually, the fight gets to its peak and we get to a cutscene that's done really well. Coda, while trying to tell Star Killer that he's not always going to be Vader's apprentice, does something which most Jedi's advise against, which is looking too much into the future with the Force. And he sees himself becoming Star Killer's new Jedi Master, which you can tell confuses him for a second, which is just enough time for Star Killer to take the advantage by blinding him and winning the fight. So Coda literally gets blinded to the present because he was focusing too much on the future. This is really good storytelling in my opinion, that this game sometimes manages to pull off. This bit of storytelling might have influenced some other Star Wars stories later. Anyway, with Coda defeated, Star Killer heads back to Vader who sends him on a few more missions to take out some more Jedis in hiding. One being a Jedi who's gone a bit loopy and started remaking a copy of the Jedi Temple with junk. This mission, while not being bad, does feel a bit like filler content. Like you'll probably only remember this level because of the difficulty with the boss fight and it's the level where you get the Force Lightning powers, which you get to try out on some Jawas. Next up is Shark T, who has been hiding in Felucia with a Jedi apprentice who looks more Sith than Jedi, who she instructs to hide when sensing Starkiller approaching the planet. I'm sure her apprentice isn't going to turn to the dark side for some reason. Starkiller bells his way through the locals, whose designs remind me of those Kodama spirit forest things from Princess Mononoke, and eventually faces up against Shark T, who gives some hard foreshadowing that Vader is going to betray Starkiller. Though Starkiller brushes this off because now with Shark T dead, his Sith training is complete, so Vader and him can finally, after years of training, take on the Emperor. Though the Emperor finds out about this plan. And you'll never guess what happens. His spies followed you here. <laughs> Yeah, Vader betrays Starkiller. Okay, so the only one shocked by this outcome is Starkiller, whose face really shows an absolute look of horror after being literally stabbed in the back by Vader. Like, he really can't believe this is happening. Well, he did get some warnings. Even though Starkiller has pretty much been a bad guy up until this point, you can't help but feel for him a little. He's been beaten down for years to achieve this goal of taking on the Emperor, and even though Vader has brutally betrayed him, he still tells Vader, come on, we can beat him. We can defeat him together! But Vader doesn't feel the same way. The scene is almost a perfect reverse of what Vader does to Luke at the end of Return of the Jedi. Also, it's great at showing how far Vader has fallen. Literally, the only thing that could change him is the thing that led him to the dark side. Being trying to protect something he loves, which isn't Starkiller. To Vader, he's nothing but a tool to be used. So, end of the story, right? <laughs> Nope. After being thrown into space, Starkiller's body is recovered by Vader, who revives him and explains the whole killing him thing was just part of his plan to throw the Emperor off, which I think most people wouldn't buy that story. Though Starkiller's Stockholm Syndrome kicks in as Vader gives him new orders to form a rebellion against the Emperor, so when they attack him, he'll be distracted by that problem. Also, Vader tells Starkiller to sever all past attachments, which includes Juno, who's being held prisoner on the ship. Remember, no witnesses. But in the first sign that Starkiller isn't totally loyal to Vader anymore, he rescues Juno, who I would definitely say he's grown attached to. Proxy's also helped Starkiller by crashing the ship he's on into a star to help get rid of any witnesses. So first bit of business is for Starkiller to find someone to help form this rebellion and help give him a little Jedi training. He remembers the perfect person for the job, being General Kota, who's been drinking away his problems ever since his defeat. Now when they first meet, I think the story is trying to give the impression that Kota doesn't know who Starkiller is because he can't see anymore, but I got the sense he knew who he was from the moment they met. He even calls him boy like he did earlier. Hell nobody fights the Empire and wins, boy. This is where the story switches to a more Jedi perspective with the missions where Star Starkiller faces his past and tries to fix the mistakes he made, including kind of scaring Shock T's apprentice to the point she uses the dark side, but he fixes that problem, sort of, maybe. Anyway, he tries to redeem himself while still sort of working for Vader, which probably isn't going to work out long term, and he even gets confronted with this by Juna, who points out quite well that he's already gone against Vader by rescuing her, which there was no real reason for him to do, but we all know the reason. Though Starkiller continues his Jedi journey by gathering allies to fight the Empire, he even rescues Leia. So as you can tell, the story is basically setting up that Starkiller founded the Rebellion, which is giving him some really super significance in the lore of Star Wars. Like they're even using his family crest for their symbol. Which might seem a little out there now, but this was a time before the shows and movies had explored this era in Star Wars, so anything could have happened. Though after what happened with The Force Unleashed 2, which is a whole nother story, and the Disney buyout, this pretty much became a what if different timeline non-canon thing. Okay, but back to the Jedi portion of the game. Going through these levels, they reuse some assets from previous missions, but it does mostly make sense for the story. And the levels do feel different enough to not seem like you're backtracking previous levels. The one thing I'll critique at this point is remember that cool trailer with the Star Destroyer being brought down? Yeah, they kind of include in the game, but it's not so great. It's kind of like a boss fight with quick time events that drag out a fair bit. It's on a mission where you strike in an Imperial shipyard to inspire more people to join the rebellion. If this is put in the game to make players feel powerful, I don't think it worked too well. Also, it's maybe a little too over the top, even for this game. Though with this mission done, Starkiller seems to have come over to the light side as he tells Vader the rebellion isn't ready yet, and that he should stay away and let Starkiller make some more progress. Even though they're having their first meeting with all the major leaders of the rebellion to plan the next move, but Vader isn't fooled and comes down hard in the gathering. Again, Starkiller is surprised by Vader's betrayal, which leads to the most obvious line in the game that the first time I heard it, I laughed a little. I lied. 
On top of this, Vader tells Starkiller that all the stuff about teaming up to kill the Emperor together was also a lie. He never intended to do that with Starkiller, he just used him to make it easy to gather all the Emperor's enemies and destroy them in one easy swoop. Vader is about to kill Starkiller permanently, but Proxy who went through a little reprogramming in the Jedi section of the story, comes in to sacrifice himself to give Starkiller a chance to escape. So all the rebel leaders are caught and Starkiller just found out he'd been lied to by Vader for basically his whole life. Seems a little hopeless, but with a little encouragement from Juno, Starkiller decides to meditate like a Jedi would to figure some stuff out. And because he has super anime protagonist powers, the first time he tries this he almost instantly finds the location of where the rebel leaders have been taken. Which is a still under construction Death Star which they rush over to. Yeah, we're about to go full power fantasy now. But before that, Juno needs to add that classic line from most Star Wars films. I have a really bad feeling about this. Because this is probably going to be a one way mission, so it's now or never to make a move. Which she does. It's a bit of a sweet scene that's followed by a badass one, as Starkiller falls into the Death Star with the music swelling as he does a dramatic superhero landing. Again, this is all great cinematography and character animations, which I really liked. It makes the game feel very Star Wars. Even though the story is a little too much of a power fantasy, I can't help but get caught up enjoying it. Anyway, so Starkiller starts wrecking his way through the Death Star to rescue the rebel leaders. Meanwhile, the Emperor, who's having some fun chatting to the rebels about how he's going to torture them, finally notices Starkiller making his way to the throne room, which makes the Emperor send out Vader to deal with him. So after some back and forth in a boss phase or two, Starkiller manages to wipe the floor with Vader and almost beats him outright. This is where the game gives you an option to pick one of two endings, which is your basic good versus evil choice. Either you choose to face the Emperor or finish off Vader in revenge for all the things he's done to you. If you pick the evil choice and kill Vader, Starkiller gets an offer to replace him as the Emperor's apprentice, but tries to betray the Emperor and gets a starship dropped on him, after having all the people he cares about killed around him. Though he doesn't die, he gets turned into a cyborg slave to do the Emperor's bidding, until he's replaced like Vader. It's a bit of a horrific fate as the game ends with Starkiller's cybernetic screams of pain and anger. Finish it. Bit of nightmare fuel that. The good ending is probably what most players will pick though, which has Starkiller fighting the Emperor and eventually winning, but being stopped by Coda from striking him down in anger. This gives the Emperor a chance to strike back, which forces Starkiller to sacrifice himself in order for the rebel leaders to escape. I like how Vader's just in the back of the scene, just watching and not doing anything. I imagine he's like, I've had a really bad day, you deal with it. Anyway, the lightning force duel between the Emperor and Starkiller ends with an explosion that kills Starkiller but oddly leaves the Emperor untouched. Vader and the Emperor chat to each other about how they kind of messed up by creating this rebellion, and we start wiped to the rebels who decide to use Starkiller's family crest that they found on Kashyyyk as a symbol for the rebellion. With the final touching scene of Juno talking to Coda about Starkiller and that even though he knew who Starkiller was the whole time and all the things he'd done, he helped them because among all the dark thoughts he sensed from Starkiller, there was one bright thought pushing him to be better, which was Juno. So that's the Force Unleashed, it's a fun Star Wars hack and slash game that maybe goes a little over the top too much to fit nicely into the Star Wars universe anymore, but it's great to mess around with. You can tell it was made with passion by LucasArts and that it was something they wanted to make as great as they could. And if you're looking for a Star Wars power fantasy where you can go a little crazy with force powers then you might enjoy this game. Though it does have some flaws which if you're a fan of Star Wars stories you might be able to overlook. Thanks for watching, see you next time. Stop.